Welcome to this meeting to discuss breast cancer awareness. In over 30 years in the NHS, I saw many changes, but one of the biggest is women becoming more educated and more aware of their own breasts and the importance of seeking help early. It really opens up more treatment options for all of them. So take up screening interviews and appointments and make sure if you're worried, go and see your doctor. So good afternoon everybody. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month and I'm delighted to welcome you to a special episode of Innovating Healthcare. My name is Paula Sheriff and I'll be chairing today's meeting. I'm a former Member of Parliament and a former Shadow Minister and also uh, the Chair of the uh, Leveling Up uh, Commission run by uh, Curia. Um, but probably more importantly for, uh, for, for today's um, event I'm a breast cancer survivor I was diagnosed during uh, during Covid in in March 2020 um, and thankfully um, thank you thanks to a, an amazing um, team of, of professionals I'm now um, no evidence of disease and, and long may it stay that way um, so today's session um, will feature panelists we have a stellar lineup um, panelists with a commitment to advancing medical research, promoting public awareness and providing compassionate care that inspire and drive oncology and breast cancer outcomes. Their unique ability to bridge the gap between medical complexities and public understanding allows us to explore the latest advancements in research, treatment options, survivor stories and crucially, the significance of early detection. We hope you enjoy this enlightening discussion dedicated to raising awareness and fostering hope in the face of breast cancer challenges. And if you want to get involved in the conversation, please do follow us at Chamber Voice, that's at Chamber Voice, or use the hashtag Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, so uh, we're going to start with a, a few questions and our panellists um, will, will come in. Um, so first of all, um, may I come to you, um, Dr. F Philippa Whitford, um, if you'd just like to, first of all, introduce yourself, but also tell us um, why breast cancer awareness is so important and what are the key messages that you would like to get across this Breast Cancer Awareness Month? Well, as Paula said, I'm Dr. Philippa Whitford. I'm now an MP, but I spent 33 years as a breast cancer surgeon. And some of the same changes I saw over that time, the one that relates to patients is how much earlier people present. When I was a young doctor, we often saw women presenting with very locally advanced cancers that frankly they'd ignored, either not understanding the signs or simply being too afraid to come forward. And frankly, that is now a rarity. And I'm really glad because of that. As a surgeon, obviously, I'm involved in what is the local and regional treatment of breast cancer, which is the breast itself and the lymph nodes under the arm. We will hear further on about drug treatment, which relates more to the biology of the tumour. But it's quite simple. The surgical options a woman has relate to how early the cancer is found, how small it is in relation to her breast and whether it's still only in the breast and hasn't spread anywhere else in particular, not having spread to the lymph nodes. So this is very much a cancer where the earlier you find it, the better we can treat it, but also we can treat it with less invasion, less side effects and giving a woman real choice. Thank you very much, Philippa. Sally, would you like to come in on this question? Yeah, so um, I'm Sally Kum. I'm the Associate Director of Nursing, Healthcare Professional Engagement and Health Information at the charity Breast Cancer Now. So my background is a, as a nurse in the NHS um, until I joined Breast Cancer Now last year. Um, and um, from, our, from Breast Cancer Now's perspective, um, you know, Breast Cancer Awareness Month is really important for, the, for that messaging um, and instilling habits um, and behaviours in, in, in women and men to, to check themselves and certainly from our latest research, 44% of people don't, uh, that we survey don't check themselves and there can be a, a multitude of barriers to that. Um, the highest being some people just forget, some people it, it's not a, a habit that they've continued. Um, people are worried that they're not doing it correctly. 
um, and for some people the fear of, of what they're going to find. So for us, it's it, it's around our TLC messaging, the touch, look, check. So it's getting to know what's normal for you so that you would recognize um, any changes. We, we offer some of the most common symptoms, but it's around recognizing any changes and, and report those and, and see, see your GP and get referred if necessary. Thank you, Sally. And also thank you for making the point that breast cancer affects men as well. We know it affects far more women, um, but it's really important that we do remember that men need to check uh, as well. Um, so thank you for that. Um, Rebecca, Sarah, would either of you like to come in on, on this particular question? Perhaps it makes sense for, for me to go first. My name is Sarah Binnicum. Um, I'm a consultant breast radiologist and lead breast radiologist in Cheltenham. And my job is basically to look at the mammograms or the ultrasounds and to diagnose these breast cancers. And ideally, we want to do that when they're very, very small through screening. And I just want to really re-emphasize what um, Philippa has said already, that uh, with most breast cancers, there's a very clear progression between how people do and how big the cancer is at diagnosis. And when I look at screening mammograms, often I'm picking up breast cancers that are well under one centimeter. So way too small for most women to have noticed any abnormality in the breast at all. And when I uh, do see women in my assessment clinics, obviously it's a very stressful time for them because most of them have no idea that there's any abnormality on the mammogram. But what I always make a point of emphasizing is that if we do pick up a little cancer, we've picked it up early on. So not only is the outlook going to be very, very good indeed, but the treatment, as Philip has said, is going to be so much less aggressive as well. And most of the women um, who have a cancer diagnosed through breast cancer screening, through mammogram screening, they don't even stay in overnight for their operations, which is such a huge change compared to you know, what we were looking at 20 or 30 years ago. And that's the message I want to get across. Don't be afraid to come for your screening mammograms. Don't be afraid if you've got a symptom, you're not wasting anybody's time, get it checked out because the earlier we pick up a significant abnormality, the better. Thank you so much, Sarah. And once again, some incredibly important um, points there. I wasn't eligible for the mammogram program because I was diagnosed age 44, but I found a very, very subtle change in my breast, which was almost like a ridge. It was never a lump. Because I was a women's health advocate and did so much work in Parliament, I decided I had needed to practice what I preached. Went to my GP who said, no, I can't feel anything, but in any case, I'm going to refer you. Thank you. You know, thankfully he did. Again, the surgeon couldn't feel anything and it transpired to be a six centimetre tumour, um, but it was lobular. Um, and lobular cancer often um, doesn't form a, a lump, if you like, in, in the same way that, that, that other cancers do. Um, so I would just reiterate that point that if there's absolutely anything, no matter how small, if it just doesn't feel right or, or it just, you know, something just feels a bit strange, you know, please, please go and get checked out. Um, Rebecca. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm Rebecca Roylance. I'm a consultant medical oncologist. Uh, so I do the other side of the, the treatment, if you like, compared to what you've already heard. So once a woman's diagnosed, I, um, I'm involved in the treatment with chemotherapy, with different systemic therapies. I think I would like to just echo partly what you've just said and partly what Sarah said in that it's really important for women both to be aware of their breasts and if they notice an abnormality to present with that to see their GP, they will then get referred um, quickly to the surgical services and have their imaging and, and assessment. And that's, you know, that's really important. It's also really important, as Sarah says, to take up those offers of screening and women from the age of 50 will be offered every three years to attend for their mammograms. And and it it's so worthwhile because, as Sarah says, she frequently picks up or the radiologists pick up tiny cancers that will never need to come and see me at all. Uh, and so they'll be managed by the surgeon. They will likely have some radiotherapy and some hormone treatment would be a, a, a very common scenario. And they don't need to meet my sort of form of oncologist, if you like, and, and have all the int more intensive treatments. So it's to be breast aware, but also to take advantage of the, of the screening programme that we have in the UK um, if called up for assessment. 
Thanks so much, Rebecca. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next question, if that's okay. And I'd like to start with, with you, Sarah, on this one, and then perhaps come to Philippa, followed by Deborah. Um, I know we, we may have already covered some of this, but could you explain the significance of early detection in improving breast cancer outcomes and what are the recommended screening methods? I know we've talked a little bit about mammograms, um, but certainly when I was diagnosed, um, I had an MRI pretty quickly, which was what actually identified that my cancer was more significant and that I needed a mastectomy rather than the the proposed lumpectomy. Yeah, um, this is this is quite a complicated area, and I I could actually speak for about two hours without drawing breath. So I'll I'll try very hard not to do that. But for most women, um, as Rebecca's already said, um, if they are at average risk, we would offer screening with mammography every three years from the age of 50 to 70. And we know there's really good evidence out there that women who attend for regular screening mammograms are much less likely to die of breast cancer. So, so we know how important that is. And so women whose risk is not above normal, that's the standard test they will be offered in this country. There's actually a lot of research going on at the moment as to whether some groups of women would uh, benefit from more intensive screening with other methods added in, but the results of uh, most of those trials are not out there yet. Um, you touched on MRI, and there are a number of situations where MRI can be very useful. So, for example, if in women who have a high risk of breast cancer because of a very strong family history, for example, they are much more likely to be offered more regular screening from an earlier age. And if their risk is very high, and these are women who have um, a genetic mutation, the most common genes that people will have heard of being the BRCA mutations. If you have a mutation in one of these BRCA genes, then you will be offered MRI screening from a very early age, and it needs to be done more often. But for the vast majority of women, fortunately, that does not apply. Um, and mammography from the age of 50 is a very good test to have. Um, I would just like to add one more thing in there. I still see quite a lot of women who say, oh, well, no, I've never bothered to come for mammography because I, I don't have a family history and I didn't think I was particularly at risk of it. And in fact, fortunately, the number of women diagnosed with breast cancer who have a family history that puts them at, at increased risk is very, very low. And what that means is that the vast majority of women who do develop it actually don't have a strong family history. So even if you think you're not at increased risk of breast cancer, you should make sure that you take up your opportunity to have mammographic screening. Thank you, Sarah. Philippa, is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, well, I think from the point of view of screening methods, Sarah has covered that. But obviously, as was the case with yourself, when patients come forward, it's actually an entire multidisciplinary team that gets involved in diagnosing a woman. And a lot of that is often done at one clinic. So they will have a mammogram, we will take a history, we will examine them, they will usually have an ultrasound of both their breast and axilla. And if there's anything to see in either of those areas, then they will have a biopsy. Where MRI comes in, obviously in screening, as Sarah talked about, but also where you have cancers, where we're clinically a bit worried, as you were with the thickening, but we're not seeing much on the mammogram, or where the biopsy shows lobular. We know lobular is always harder to assess on mammography. And therefore we would often use MRI to get a better idea of size before we plan the surgery. And the whole basis of our multidisciplinary team approach is to get as much information about the patient and her cancer before we do anything so that we actually have a treatment plan right from the start. Thank you, Philippa. It sounds like I had a pretty classic experience because what you explained there was literally exactly what I had, a mammogram, ultrasound, biopsies, and then I was aware there was a multidisciplinary team that actually decided on my treatment options. So, yeah. Um, Deborah, would you like to come in here? I don't know if you've got anything you'd like to add in, in, in this particular area. Yeah, so my name is Deborah Wyatt. I work for a company called IQVIA, working in real world evidence. Um, but I'm also a breast cancer survivor. My story's 
fairly similar to yours, Paula. I was diagnosed in March 2020. Um, I am in my 50s, in my late 50s, so I'd already had two um, regular mammograms that I'd been called up for when I was sort of 50, 51, and then again around about 54. Um, both were clear, everything was fine, like you, felt a bit of a thickening, didn't think it was right, and went through exactly the same as you, um, you know, a, a mammogram, an ultrasound and a biopsy. Um, and I think, you know, the, the mammogram uh, programme is absolutely vital. Uh, I think women should be taking up the opportunity to be screened. Lots of women get picked up through screening. Uh, and I think that, you know, it, it is a good way of catching breast cancers at the early stage. I think the only other thing I'd probably like to add at this stage is that um, what I didn't know before I had breast cancer is there are some breast cancers that can be prevented. Some cancers can be prevented. And I think that having maybe more information and more knowledge about things that I could do in my lifestyle that may or may not have reduced my risk of breast cancer would have been really helpful to know. And so I think that's an area potentially where there's still a lot of work that could be done. Thank you, Deborah. And thank you for sharing your story about being a breast cancer survivor as, as, as well, um, which I think the point that you've just made takes us really nicely onto our next area that I'd like to cover, um, which is about the common risk factors for, for breast cancer. I think we hear a lot in the media and, and we read a lot, don't we, about sort of things like obesity and, and smoking and, and, and exercise. Um, so what are the common risk factors for breast cancer and how can individuals make lifestyle choices that reduce their risk. Philippa, can I ask you to comment on that first of all, please? Um, well, certainly, you know, when I was a young surgeon, other than, you know, how many children you had and how early you had them, we didn't really think there were all that many lifestyle contributors to breast cancer. Certainly not the big key, such as smoking and lung cancer. But we have certainly learned that particularly after the menopause, obesity is a big issue because even though your ovaries are no longer working, you actually make small amounts of estrogen in your fatty tissue. So particularly looking after your weight and exercise, as you said, after the menopause can help contribute to reducing your risk. And another one that kind of appeared later was the contribution of alcohol. Um, you know, this was something that obviously came as a bit of a shock. And particularly as wine glasses have got bigger to accommodate virtually half a bottle of wine, um, us women do need to think about just how much alcohol we're drinking. It doesn't mean you're out on the town or absolutely drunk, but you do need to look at these kind of things. They still come back, I would say, to the five key things all of us should do for health, and that includes risk of all cancers. So don't smoke and don't do drugs. Look at your weight, look at your exercise, and look at your diet. And if you're you're kind of doing these kind of things, and particularly within your diet, even if you are having alcohol, have it in moderation. And that way, you're not just protecting yourself from breast cancer, you're actually reducing your risk of a lot of illnesses. I wonder if there's anything that you'd like to contribute around risk factors. I mean, I would agree with, with what Philippa said. It's it's not the same as with, for example, lung cancer and smoking. So what I advise women, and, and I think it's something that women ask most commonly, why did this happen? Uh, and how can I, what can I do to avoid it happening again? And and they're quite difficult questions, I think, because we don't have really neat answers. I think it is a case of of eating a healthy, balanced diet. I think there's a lot of talk about, you know, estrogens in the diet and, and avoiding all dairy. And and my advice to women is that you there's no need to be really strict and avoid something that you really like. It's all about healthy balanced diet and i think the most important thing we've learned in recent times is the importance of exercise and you know we spend an awful lot of money on new drugs uh, but actually exercise reduces the risk of recurrence and certainly that's really good advice to women who've been through treatment to obviously perhaps during chemotherapy if they're having intensive therapy that's quite hard to be very active but just simple walks regularly throughout the week is really beneficial and certainly we we know about the power of exercise thank you very much rebecca deborah i wonder as somebody with lived experience i don't know if you can empathize with this but when i was diagnosed the first thing i asked my 
doctor having had absolutely no family history of breast cancer was how did it get there and of course the doctor said well I'm you know unfortunately I, I can't tell you that but I just wondered if, if, if you can identify with that at all yeah I can um and actually my mother had um, who's no longer with us but she'd had breast cancer so my first question was you know have I got a cancer that's related to the cancer my mother had and I did have genetic testing and it came back negative and I was told unfortunately it's just bad luck um so I can completely identify with that and I spent a lot of time soul searching thinking you know could I have done things differently in earlier in my life did I drink too much when I was at university I smoked once upon a time you know and all of the things that I think we beat ourselves up about so I absolutely identify with that I think all you can do is draw a line in the sand and say okay so I am where I am but perhaps to reduce my risk of a reoccurrence then maybe I should make some you know for me it was a few tweaks because I my lifestyle wasn't too bad actually in my 50s um and so that's all I've done I've made some tweaks and I, I exercise regularly I don't drink alcohol anymore I have high focus plant-based diet and 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 try to to make sure that you know each day I'm ticking the boxes that make me feel I'm making contribution towards um reducing that risk moving forward so yeah completely identify with everything that's just been said Thanks very much, Deborah. OK, um, moving on, I just wondered if our panellists today um, could share some insights into the latest advancements in breast cancer treatment and research and how these innovations are shaping the future of care. Mm -hmm. And I'm really interested. I don't know about yourself, Deborah, as I, I'm on endocrine therapy, um, which is which is difficult, really <laughs> difficult at times. And I just wondered if, if, if you're aware um, of, any, of anything that, that's coming up there. So um, I think um, it makes sense to um, go to our um, oncologist um, and um, that will be uh, Rebecca on this one. Thank you. And then Thank I'll come you. to Philippa and then Sally, if that's OK. Thanks very much. Well, I, I mean, I think the first thing to say is how positive it's been. Uh, to be an oncologist managing breast cancer over the last few years. We've had a huge number of new drugs. You know, just since 2017, we've had 20 new nice pro drugs, of which seven have been approved just in the last year. So that shows that, you know, real progress is being made. Um, you talked about your experience on endocrine therapy, and undoubtedly, women can have a really difficult time on, on those drugs, but we have to help manage those side effects and perhaps one of the most uh, exciting new drugs that's come through is for women who are at high risk of recurrence after their early curative treatment having an additional medication to the endocrine therapy that makes the endocrine therapy more effective now that does increase the duration of treatment they have another two years of, of tablets it's not without its side effects but it's making a real difference in terms of overall survival and to to be in an area where there have been so many advances is really good news and really good news for women. And, you know, it comes back to what we were saying earlier, really come and present early. But if you haven't presented early or, you, you know, your tumour is bigger than expected, breast cancer these days is really treatable. We have a real armamentarium. We know so much more about breast cancer. We know that, you know, it's not just one type. Uh, we know that there's lots of different subtypes that behave differently, have different therapeutic options. So um, I think in terms of new treatments, uh, it is really positive. And just as Sarah said, she could talk for hours on uh, on imaging. Yeah. I'll stop there. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> happy to be more targeted. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Philippa, would you like to respond to that one? Uh, well, I, I would agree with Rebecca. I mean, certainly having been involved in uh, drug trials, radiotherapy trials, surgical trials throughout my 33 years, I'm very conscious of just how fast breast cancer treatment changes. But also I graduated in 1982 and my first job was on a breast cancer unit. So the change that I've seen in the last 40 years is literally night and day. When I was working on the wards, women with who had a lump went to sleep, the lump went to the lab, and if it was cancer, they woke up with a mastectomy and all the lymph nodes under their arm removed. They didn't know in advance what they were going to have done. And I remember watching those women groping themselves while still on a trolley, because they knew if you had a drip and a lot of bandages, 
it meant you had cancer. In the mid 80s, the development of cytology, the development of one stop clinics and the focus on having a diagnosis before you start treatment really changed things. Women started to be involved. We started to have breast cancer nurses who were supporting them in the decision making. And we also saw the emergence with greater breast cancer awareness of women managing to keep their breasts. That then there was a step change in the 90s after breast screening started in 1991, because as Sarah was talking about earlier, suddenly we were finding tiny cancers that we couldn't even feel. So as surgeons, we had a new challenge. How do you remove something that you can't feel? But all of this has meant that the surgery for most women with breast cancer, but particularly those found early by coming forward with a lump or early through breast screening means that we can keep the breast and we also don't remove all of the lymph glands under their arm. And therefore we see far fewer cases of what's called lymphedema, a big swollen arm, which related to the amount of scar tissue you had in your armpit. So what we're seeing is treatment getting lighter for the majority, while as Sarah says, even for women who present either with an advanced cancer or a really difficult cancer, we keep developing more and more new options. And that means that we have so much in our weapons chest that we can fight uh, the cancer with. So it's not a cancer women should be afraid to come forward, but equally the earlier they come forward, the easier the treatment and the more choices they have. Thank you, Philippa, and thank goodness that things have evolved in those 40 years. And I think I speak on behalf of us all when I say an enormous thank you for your 40 years of service in, in supporting um, predominantly women with, with their breast oh. cancer challenges. Well, when I started, there were no women surgeons in Scotland and very few in the whole UK. And when I said I wanted to specialise in breast cancer, I was told it wasn't a specialty. And, you know, I was kind of talking nonsense. Thankfully, while we still need more women in surgery, things have changed and there are a lot of women surgeons and indeed women specialists in the entire multidisciplinary team who work within the breast field. And thank goodness you did, Philippa. Thank you. Sally, can I ask if you'd like to comment on, on this particular area? Well, I guess um, from a breast cancer now point of view, obviously part of our role is funding research in all those areas that you know people have have mentioned in terms of you know surgery chemotherapy and I'm thinking you know even in having been you know one of those clinical nurse specialist changes in you know uh recent changes in the duration of things like radiotherapy treatment um you know within breast cancer now we also have quality and influencing and that's about access to all these new treatments and you know people being able to to get to get that access um, and the other aspect that I guess which really calls to to my role within the organization is actually supporting people through those treatments so you know on our helpline we talk to people every day that are struggling to continue taking maybe their hormone therapy um, and it's about supporting people through those treatments and also lots of research that's going on um, talking to other things that have been mentioned around things like prehabilitation so that exercise um, for people that are about to um, start treatment but also as Rebecca said you know exercise for people who have who are going through treatment or completed treatment for the, for reducing the risk of, of recurrence so I think you know for us it's 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 trying to tackle things from all of those three positions. Absolutely thank you Sally. Um, Sarah would you like to um, come in on this one? There's a, a couple of things that just struck me and the first is that in many ways, it's hard to think of much that's good about COVID. But actually, in terms of breast cancer, there have been one or two things about it that were that COVID really helped. So we mentioned radiotherapy already, but COVID was in large part responsible for fast tracking the trend towards very short, more intense courses of radiotherapy. Which is what I which is what I was um, had actually I had five yeah more stronger I, sessions yes. and, 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 it, and it saved in terms of traveling and absolutely it, it's so much it's, easier to have it done in a week rather than the so much more convenient yeah. for the women and on the same um track um the other thing it enabled us to do was move away from how we helped the surgeons out by 
localizing these tiny little cancers. So when we are picking up these small screen detected cancers, often what used to happen is that women would have to come into the breast unit on the day of the operation to have these bendy flexible wires put into the breast on the day of the operation. And then they would have to leg it across to the operating theatres and, and have the procedures they needed to have a, a sample of the glands in the armpit. Can you just imagine how stressful that was on the day of your operation? And COVID enabled us to move across what's called non-wire localization. So we can put tiny little seeds and little markers in way ahead of the operation. So it's it's much more patient focus than it used to be, I would say, and and thank goodness for it. So yeah, maybe one of the few positive things that's come out of COVID. That's a really interesting perspective. Thank you, Sarah, very thought provoking as well. Okay, uh, moving on, um, I'd be interested to talk about um, what we need to do to improve early access to the medicine scheme and the cancer drugs fund. Can I start with you there, Rebecca, please? Yes, thank you. So I think when we take part in clinical trials and we get um, the data from trials, knowing that we've got a new drug that impacts outcomes, we as a, a clinical community are really keen to, to get access to them as soon as possible. And of course, you know, there are understandable regulations to go through, but sometimes that does take a while and and we know that you know the drugs are there we want to be able to access them and i think having compassionate access schemes are a way for patients to access drugs ahead of any formal nice approvals but it, it's not necessarily um the most straightforward and maybe not necessarily really easily accessible for all. So I think, you know, once we get the trial data, we need there to be a really speedy process between licensing and then approvals and funding within the NHS so that patients all get access as soon as possible to, to, to the new drugs that we know are effective. And I think that's where, and I'm sure Sally's going to come in and talk about how, you know, how we're helped along really in, in those processes. Yeah, thank I you, mean, Rebecca. Um, Deborah, can I bring you back in? Um, all I would add to that really is that I'm aware of the Early Access to Medicine Scheme and Cancer Drugs Fund because I work in a large clinical research organisation. Um, and I just feel that perhaps, you know, it's all about empowering patients and maybe, you know, um, aware, wider awareness. And I know that Sally will probably uh, talk to this in a minute. You know, we really need to rely probably on charities like Breast Cancer now to start raising or continue to raise the awareness of some of the drugs that fall within these two um, funds, just so that patients are aware that there are drugs that exist that may not be easily accessible, but potentially could offer a lifeline. Uh, in certain cases. Thank you, Deborah. And um, moving on to our next question, uh, I suspect this is something that you may also have a, like me, quite quite a strong opinion on, um, Deborah. What kind of wellbeing support should breast cancer patients and survivors receive? And how can a healthcare, how can our healthcare system address holistic needs? Because I think we're all very conscious that the NHS has very restricted capacity, but I think there is something when you reach the end of your treatment, it's kind of you go from potentially having several appointments a week a week and having your, you know, your your breast cancer nurse and, and you know, and so many things going on. And suddenly, hopefully you get told that you've been cured and it's like, right, that's it. Like, you know, where do I go now? And there's amazing charities like Breast Cancer Now and Macmillan, and I've been able to use both of those and, and have really positive experiences. Um, but, you know, I, I wonder what can be done, you know, both during the treatment, but also when the treatment has ended. So I just wonder, do you want to respond yeah. to that, Deborah? Yeah, sure. I mean, for me, during my treatment, I couldn't have asked for better care from my oncologist to my surgeon to my um, chemotherapy nurses. But as you say, at the end of treatment, it's this sort of right, you know, your treatment's finished, no evidence of disease, sort of off you go. And it's like, off you go and do what? And and how do you, what what's next? You know, you suddenly feel that the, the safety blanket's been ripped from underneath you and you're completely alone. 
And I think there's a lot to be said for, um, for the work that charities do. I mean, I, like you, have used Macmillan and Breast Cancer Now. I'm actually a volunteer for Breast Cancer Now for their Someone Like Me programme helping ladies at various stages of their um, journey to you know to talk to somebody who's been there done it and got the t-shirt but I'd like to see and again you know it's all down to, to funding of course but I'd quite like to see a bit more joined up thinking between the NHS and these charities so that perhaps when you leave you know the, the last appointment you're given a leaflet or some information or something to say you know there are these charities out there that you could go to and that can provide support for you and I think that not everybody is as proactive potentially as you and I, Paula, are going and searching for the help yes. and support. So to have a bit more joined up thinking between the NHS and, and, and the charities, I think would be a, a really good bridge um, to, to help patients moving forward. Thank you, Deborah. I absolutely echo that. Um, Sally, um, I'm aware of the um, Someone Like Me programme, which is absolutely brilliant. And um, I just wondered if, if you've got any thoughts on, on holistic needs of, of people either going through treatment or or perhaps have we, as we've discussed at the end of the treatments. Yeah, I mean, I guess there is the holistic needs assessment, which is the process which, you know, nurses or cancer support workers are undertaking within the NHS. And that's within certain timescales of someone's pathway, making those holistic needs assessment assessment to you know hopefully meet those needs and some of that might be signposting yeah to, to charities such as such as ourselves and um someone like me has been mentioned you talked about that kind of we very much want to work in collaboration with the nhs and so you know bridging um those relationships we have something called here for you which is where we can then nurses can refer the patients and then we can take over from there so that we can then say this is these are all the services we offer and also our role is signposting as you say out to to, to other charities as well Macmillan have amazing financial support so you know we also our role is also about empowering patients and, and signposting them elsewhere but for us yeah we also have our moving forward program so this is where people have finished their hospital-based treatment they may still be carrying on some other treatments um, and this is a, a as I said, again, about empowering patients and, and making that assessment of what are their needs at, at that time. So maybe, you know, the side effects of the hormonal therapies. We offer services for younger women affected by breast cancer who may have specific issues about talking to their children, fertility. You know, lots of people talk about sex and intimacy impact, body image impact, you know, breast reconstruction and the current weights for delayed reconstruction. So it's about trying to everyone's needs will be different and as you say that holistic assessment is about that individualized care and assessing people's needs thank you um sally okay i'm going to move on to our um, last question now and i'd like to put this to to everybody if that's okay um so looking forward and whilst october is breast cancer awareness month i'm sure you you all agree that it's really important that we promote being breast aware in all 12 months of the year, not, not just in, in October. Um, but what are the key goals and strategies for sustaining breast cancer awareness efforts beyond the Breast Cancer Awareness Month? Um, Rebecca, would you like to go first? Just because you're first on my screen there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think it's about embedding it really into sort of general discussions, you know, to for women to be aware of of their breasts and to know and to report any changes as we kind of talked about right at the very start and and I think for different communities that that might work in different ways you know there's various initiatives like you know certain Jewish populations have a really high um, incidence because of an inherited predisposition and there's sort of initiatives to go into schools to educate the the teenagers who can then educate people back home uh, there's a, there's different initiatives, for example, going into mosques because uh, the, the Asian women population may have a different attitude. And so it's it's really trying to target people at, at opportunities that you have, really. Uh, and so whilst October is a great time to focus the mind, we need to be doing those things all year round. Thanks very much, Rebecca. Um, Sarah. Uh, thank you, Paula. I, I'd just like to add to that, really. Um, Something we're very aware of in the breast screening community is inequalities of access and appreciation of why it's a good thing 
And I think a crucial role for us all is to get out in the communities and have um, spokespeople who can get the message across because, you know, we do see inequalities of uptake and we know that uptake for screening is a lot less in big urban inner city areas where there are a lot more diverse ethnicities and populations and and really getting that message out there to everybody I think is so so important and I know that there are lots of groups up and down the country looking at that because we we've got to really address those issues and it's all about I think communication and education we need to get the message out there that thank god by and large breast cancer is not the horrible entity that it was when Philip and I started practicing all those years ago and we it, unfortunately even in this day and age I see women who have presented with late with quite advanced cancers because they've been too frightened of what the treatment might be involving and we, we really need to get those messages out there year round and, and fit our message for the communities that we're trying to reach I think. Thank you, um, Sarah. And I think there's also something about saying to people as well, and I certainly do this with, with, with my friends and on social media, you know, if you're unsure about anything, just go and get it checked out. You won't be laughed at, you won't be shouted at by the health professional. You know, the chances are it probably will be nothing. You know, I suspect most things that turn up at a breast cancer clinic and, and don't transpire to be malignant and cancerous, you know, but 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 if it is, then you know the earlier you catch it, the more chance you have of it being curative. So that's certainly my my mantra. So thank you very much, um, Sally. Yeah, I guess I would echo everything that that's been said. Um, October is an opportunity, but for us, it's it's continuing that messaging throughout the year, our, our TLC campaign, and and I agree, it's um, it. it, it one modality of doing that or one method of doing that it won't be right for everyone so you know we use social media but we also use print and leaflets um we you know we have case studies we get people telling their stories because people really relate to other other people um and and i guess also um you know working through all those different modalities it's about embedding it's it's about embedding behaviors um and so that cuts across all kind of age groups and um and we already talked about kind of men and women so uh, yeah thank you sally and uh, deborah well people that know me know that i talk a lot about breast cancer <laughs> because um i'm very open um about what happened to me because i think um going back to what sally was say saying and echoing some of the other people here um you know if, if people know somebody in real life that's had the you know breast cancer they're more likely to sit up and listen and i just think if i can educate one person um who you know finds something that is curable then i've kind of done my job as a uh, breast cancer survivor so I think it's just keeping for me I'm working in a medical environment anyway it's about keeping cancer generally and breast cancer on the radar thanks Deborah and I, I so identify with, with that as well having um, having gone through a similar experience so thank you very much so that concludes our our questions for this afternoon. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the session today. And thank you very much um, to Rebecca, to Sarah, to Sally, to Deborah and to Philippa for joining us and for your excellent advice and your expertise. Um, just to reiterate um, that if you'd like to um, if you'd like to follow Chamber on Twitter, you can do at Chamber Voice. That's no gaps at Chamber Voice. And you can also use, use the hashtag, um, hashtag Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, so thank you again. And that concludes um, this episode today. Thank you. Thank you.